And uh, tonight's guest is uh, Lucy Czesalkova. She's here in person. I'm really happy about that. And um, tonight, um, Florian Hoof will um, fill in for Daniel Fairfax, who, who can't be here in person. So um, Florian Hoof will do the introduction and I'll hand over to him and um, wish you a nice evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming, despite the strange circumstances. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce Lucy Czesakowska. <coughs> is an associate professor at the Department of Film Studies at Charles University in Prague, and she's also editor-in-chief of the Czech Film Studies journal Illumines. She also closely collaborates with the National Film Archive in Prague, and as I recently learned, she actually works there. Her research focuses on the history of non-fiction and documentary film and the history of film distribution and movie going. And at the moment she works on research that focuses on the consumer imagination of the Czechoslovak German communist dictatorship. And she was or still is principal investigator with the National Research Project, International Research Project, Visual Culture of Trauma, Trauma. Ob, ob liberation and reconstruction in post World War II Europe, and she published a couple of books. Um, for example, Atoms of Eternity on Czech short films of the 1930s and 50s, and she's the co-editor of the book The Dictator of Time, decontextualizing the phenomenon of Laterna Magnica, published in 2019. And um, why I'm specifically thrilled to introduce her tonight, uh, she also wrote a great article on the representation of water energy in the Czech visual culture that will be pub published later this year in, a, I would call this a massive anthology entitled Films That Work Harder and that I had the pleasure to co-edit. So please, please give a war warm welcome to Lucy and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Björn, and thank you, Florian, for a very nice uh, introduction, and thank you all for coming. I learned that this is the best day to be in Frankfurt <laughs> for a long time, actually. And uh, yeah, we will um, have a pleasure to watch uh, Vera Chytilová's Prague, The Restless Heart of Europe. Uh, which is a documentary film. So uh, if any one of you were following the retrospective, it is a rare occasion, not, not, not really rare, because you probably had a chance to watch already uh, Hitilova versus Forman, but it is not uh, always, think we are not always thinking about Hitilova as a documentary film director. So uh, yeah, this, is will, this will be the chance. So I really would like to begin with reminding us that uh, although this is not a frequently mentioned topic, the career of Viera Chytilová has always been linked to documentary form. And uh, she was mostly appreciated for her highly stylized allegories, start, uh, allegories uh, but she really started with documentary film. Already in her second year of studies at FAMU, uh, the film uh, school in Prague, she made the documentary film Zelená ulice, Green Street, which is her student film, in which she used an ingenious montage to dramatize at a first glance the everyday event from the train traffic, such as the transport of heavy loads. Her first engagement after her studies then was not at Barandov, uh, a spect spectacular studio of Czech fi fiction film based in Prague, but at a studio of popular scientific film, where she made her uh, very stick fiction films Ceiling and Bag of Fleas. In these, she combined the real stories and banality of everyday with the hi hyperbole and dilemmas of adolescent women. Prague, the restless heart of Europe, is for Chytilová one of the returns to documentary form during the period of so-called normalization. This term is usually used and refers to the 1970s and 1980s in Czechoslovakia, which was the era following after 1968 and preceding the Velvet Revolution of uh, 1989. 
And the occupation by the Soviet army in 1968, as you may know, also had key impacts on culture. The reforms and purges following it interrupted or suspended the work of a number of filmmakers who, especially in the 70s, found it difficult to get any commissions in cinema. However, at the beginning of 80s, uh, the, the beginning of the 80s means some changes, a grating openness of system to younger filmmakers, but also to previously unthinkable topics, such as turning to youth, adapting Western trends of pop culture, such as youth music films, disco music, etc. Et Nevertheless, Viera Chytilová was very active uh, during this period, especially at the turn of the 1970s and 80s, and uh, she did a number of her remarkable, remarkable films in that period, such as Panel Story, Emergency, or Founts Very Late Afternoon. She's, she was known for her stubborn nature, her courage in promoting themes and scripts, despite the oversight of the Communist Party's apparatus. It is essential to stress that Hitilova's return to documentary film in this period was motivated from abroad. In a Belgian production in 1981, she made a disputation Hitilova versus Forman, in which she confronted her generational co companion Miloš Forman with her own views on art, filmmaking, life and creative identity, asking provocative questions and trying to get him outside thinking his comfort zone, which gave this film a, a basic dynamic, was characteristic of Chytilová's approach to film, but also to life. Chytilová's involvement in the film Prague, the Restless Heart of Europe, also had foreign origins. This film was commissioned by an Italian television production, Rai, which, is, which in the early 80s was working on a documentary series of portraits of major European cities as centers of culture. For these films, Rai engaged directors of art film, of whom Hitilova was the only female author. If we simply put the choice of cities on the map, we will see a picture of a south, south, southeastern cradle of European culture, which in the political situation of the beginning uh, of the dis disintegration of the Eastern Bloc, transcends West centrism and uh, through a turn to culture and history, redraws European borders divided by the Iron Curtain. This series of city symphonies by a number of progressive new wave directors like Theo An Angeopoulos, Miklos Jancho, Manuel de Oliveira or Krzysztof Zanussi, to name just a few, not only offers a unique insight into the situation of everyday urban metropolises in the 80s, but also allows to reveal a number of stereotypes in the filmic portrayal of the city as a specific topos as well as to reflect on the different creative practices of individual authors. Uh, the, the images on, you can see on the slide are from the three first uh, films about uh, Lisbon, Athens and Milano. And uh, in the following sentences I will refer mainly to these uh, three films which I had the opportunity to watch. All the authors, with the exception of Olmi, use historical urban visuality, various graphics, maps and paintings, paintings representing cities in their films to illustrate and deepen their reflections on history through visual memory. Olmi's film is indeed a 1983 film, as you can see even in the title, it's Milano 1983, uh, and contains no commentary at all, is a city symphony in the original sense of the word. While the Oliveira then proceeds rather didactically, didactically Angeopoulos offers a contemplative view of Athens, made special by the staging of mythological icons, namely male angels in the modern backdrop of the city. Contrary to these approaches, Hitilova stands out above by what we hear already in the title of her film, The Restlessness. From the first shots, in which the camera literally crawls across the facades of buildings and the rhythm of this movement is constantly interrupted by cuts of other sh sh shots from the urban every day, it is obvious that the piece of her film will be relentless. For Hitilova and her previous work, this film is at the same time un un uncharacteristic of a turn to the past. 
as a theme that her other films hardly open up. For her, a more natural position uh, is that of a present, or of an allegory, or fanciful satire, that is, uh, forms take, taking place in timelessness without any historical anchor. This film, on the other hand, in this film, on the other hand, she uses her typical philosophical and moralistic point of view to ponder the traces of the past in the present. It is a reflection on Prague as a city evolving in time and space. The relationship between the present and the past, time and space, is absolutely crucial for the assembly structure of Chytilová's collage-like city symphony, Prague, the Restless Heart of Europe. As one of the refrains of the voiceover of this film, we, we hear the gloss, the old, I quote, the old age passes away and the new one arrives, through which Chytilová reminds us of the ephemerality of historical trends and styles. At the beginning of the film, as a certain starting point for her approach, she remarks, I quote, everywhere we go, we walk on or we step on history, unquote. The words of the voiceover thus ascribe an essential historical dimension to the materiality of the city. What we as viewers are supposed to see is history reflected in ancient facades, the present perceived as history. At the same time, Hitilova's approach is clearly informed by the traditional ways of depicting the city, against which she defines herself, when she opens the whole film by the iconic panorama of Hradčany, one of the most reproduced pictures of Prague, and adds a comment that, I quote, Prague is not a postcard, I unquote. This point of departure then allows her to develop considerations that go against iconicity and to emphasize that understanding our presence requires knowledge of history, tradition, in its complexity and ambivalence. This is what Hitilova in the film calls repeatedly, again in the form of some, something like a refrain, an awareness of context. Her aim is to ask in a visual form what is tradition, how to encompass history in the plurality of its manifestations, in the plasticity of experience. And uh, this refrain and really repeatedly, repeatedly, uh, 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 evolving uh, quote is uh, goes like this, I quote, the most important is an awareness of context, positive and negative relationships, an awareness of tradition and a view that encompass a broad horizon. This says the voiceover of the deep distinctive voice of Miroslav Macháček, whom you may know uh, also from Chytilová's film Vlčí, Vlčí Bouda. And he means the need to subject our knowledge to review, not to be satisfied with simple interpretations, and above all, to relate to history and culture as essential sources of this knowledge. In this lecture, I want to focus primarily on how Chytilová represents this awareness of context in a film form. Prague, the restless heart of Europe, is a city film symphony that, at the same time, historicizes the modernity of the 1980s. Hitilva perceives the present as a history in the making and deconstructs the connection between present and the history through audiovisual layers of memory. Hitilva is also faithful to the project of an Italian series of documentaries about the cultural centers of Europe, and in her interpretation, she primarily, though not exclusively, turns to the history of culture. As we will see, the key narrative layer of the film is the historical development of artistic and in particular architectural styles. This layer is not the only axis that adheres to this, this layer is also the only axis that adheres to the chronological order of historical development. We follow the transformation of Romanesque culture into Gothic, further into Renaissance, Baroque, Classicism and Romanticism, as well as the flattera of architectural styles of the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. Hitilva continues in the chronology afterwards, capturing some of the important historical events of the 20th century. However, this basic layer is constantly disrupted not only by the movement of the detached camera, but above all, by the cut of shots of a completely different nature. 
Within this disruptive, deconstructive position of the film, we can distinguish several other layers of imagery. The audiovisual collage is complemented by numerous shots of the everyday of, of the early 80s, a layer of cultural references, and stylized staged shots of models that we can understand as self-references of the artistic expression of Vera Hechitilová herself. Each of these layers I would now comment in more detail. As has already been said, the key, and one might say dominant layer, consists of shots of architecture. These are taken at the time of the film's production, but bear his historical memory as representatives of various historical styles. For Hitilova, the architecture is also a kind of a gateway to the present in its intellectual and cultural manifestations. The historical line, shown as a rel relentless succession of different epochs and aesthetic codes, is then interpersed by Hitilova with shots from the everyday of the 80s, which is represented primarily by the traffic of the modern city, but also by the bustle of people passing through or running through its streets. Prague of the 1980s is shown as a lively city, but in which the director is not interested in individuals and details of their lives, but rather in the mass, the whole and its movement through the urban space. The second layer, which interlaces the historical chronology, is the layer of diverse cultural references, quotations and borrowings, manifesting themselves both in, uh, in the image and in the, in the sound. These cultural references may in some cases complement the chronological order, but in other cases they go against history, disrupt strictly strict historicity, and bring to the interpretation disturbing dynamics so typical for Kitilova's work, her style, and montage techniques. One such sublayer is historical visual culture, which I referred to as one of the stereotypes of historist urban depiction. Like the authors of other documentaries in the Italian television series, of which Prague, the Restless Heart of Europe, is a part, Hitilova works with historical engravings, graphics, maps, or paintings, as well with period frescoes. However, she does, not so, uh, does so not in the didactic way, but with a sense for the artistic qualities of the work, and above all, in an attempt to give the viewer an insight into the contemporary visual imagination. She does likewise with the musical background, combining mo modern music with musical styles characteristic of the particular epoch or period. Another intersecting layer, which at first disturbs the historicity but is subsequently run down by history, is a layer of shots from the early era of cinema, matched in sepia color. These shots represent the historical life of the city and its people, and allow Hitilova to compare the old form of streets and squares with that known by audiences from the early 1980s. In addition, Hitilova includes a whole register of footage, footage referencing cultural expressions from the early 1980s. Specifically, uh, these are examples from contemporary Czech theatre, which she inter inserts in part rather associatively and thematically into the chronology. For example, the recording from the production of the Jerk and the Queen that illustrates the Middle Ages, which is the picture in the middle. The production of Amadeus comments on the classicism period of the second half of the 18th century, the left picture. But at other times, however, she inserts the theater references more haphazardly. She presents the cult semaphore theater, but also serious pieces of the national theater. And for a few moments, she also includes footage from the production of the Black Monk, uh, the right gif, which was the work of Laterna Magica, a well-known Prague multimedia theater, using a moving image as a part of the stage design. Like theater, Hitilova also works with references from Czech feature films. Uh, for example, the era of Husit, Husit Wars is illustrated by footage from one of the most spectacular historical war productions in the history of Czech cinema, Jan Žiška, and Hitilová's by Hitilová's teacher at FAMU, the matador of Czech cinema, Otakar Vavra. Various quotations of period texts, as well as Czech poetry, also permeate the commentary of the film. 
spe specifically for, uh, for the supreme work of Czech literary romanticism, the lyric epic poem Mime by Karel Hinek Macha. The pas passage used by Hitilva is a very well known example of the use of oxymoron, e.g. the contrasting expression in poetry in Czech culture. The conclusion of the film, which we will come to later, consists of several verses from the work of the author of the interval, Avant-Garde, Vyacheslav Nezval. Poetry occurs in the form of the spoken word in the film, and it is worth noting that the film's soundtrack also works in a similar montage way to the visual one. Voiceover quotes, period lyrics, features excerpts from films uh, or from theatrical productions, and the spoken word in inter is interspersed by music, some of which corresponds to the historical epoch currently depicted, but some with modern times. In one sequence, Hetilva uses radical manipulations of the soundtrack to describe the era of various power struggles of noble families. And this uh, radical, radical manipulation is also really uh, significant for her montage style. These, uh, uh, these struggles are represented by accelerated shots of family crests and an incomprehensible un dialogue. And this is to represent an era of constant talking that rarely led to an argument. And I will uh, like show you an example, and it's, uh, it's not with subtitles, but you will understand the montage technique because it's the incomprehensible dialogue. <laughs> And uh, what are the last words, oh, again in a in very ex expressive way, uh, of the voiceover by Miroslav Macháček. It's uh, talking, talking, and agreement. Uh, in Czech language, it's talking, talking, uh, it's uh, mluvení, mluvení, domluvení, which also has this uh, st st same uh, part of the word within. So it works, again, like a poet, po in a poetic, poetic way. Hitilova also appropriates documentary footage of historical events, primarily to capture the time of the Second World War, when the Czech lands were occupied by Nazi Germany as the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, and also of the first years after the Second World War. This series of footage is incorporated into the film in chronological logic, and it is advisable to pause briefly on it, because in the way it is used in partially in the way it is used, it partially deviates from the dominant rationality of the film. While we have previously said that Hitilova defines herself against iconicity, in the case of these events, on the contrary, she chooses the shots that became symbols of the liberation of Prague in May 1945, and, in, uh, and these were used regularly in the following post-war decades as symbols, visual symbols. The shots of the dropping of German signs in the streets of Prague, the shots of barricades, but above all the arrival of Red Army tanks and its greeting with lilacs, then follows one of the iconic speeches of Clement Gottwald, who, as a chairman of the, chairman of the Communist Party and future uh, Czechoslovak president, uh, Gottwald in 1948 turned the country for the next 40 years to a purely communist government. This speech, represented without any disruption, is firstly the only explicitly political document used in the film, and simultaneously a document that the official political power in post-war Czechoslovakia itself reproduced and made a, made a symbol of communist rule. And I will uh, just uh, show uh, this excerpts, which is again without, without any subtitles, but uh, this is to show you that in this sequence, the disruption is not uh, taking place so often as you will see in the rest of the film, and the, the speech is delivered in a whole, without any, uh, any disruption. <laughs> Podal návrh 
na přijetí demise ministrů, kteří odstoupili 20. února této roku. Mohu vám sdělit, že pan prezident všechny mé návrhy přijal. And this kind of speech was really repeated as a legitimizing uh, speech of the communist rule in the whole uh, 40 years of, uh, of uh, the communist government in socialist Czechoslovakia. And it is at this moment that Chytilová, through indistinctly at a first glance, steps out of her role and the film itself thus also points to the historicity of its creation. It is probable that this sequence became a sop to the communist party whose representatives throughout the whole period of communism oversaw the culture and, above all, also made sure that the image of Czechoslovakia shown abroad on the one hand represented high artistic values, but on the other hand did not disturb the official cultural political line of the party. This emphasis precisely of the, on the formative period of the end of the Second World War and the Communist Party's takeover of power in this film reproduces the key historical and visual symbols that the party has long used to legitimize the, uh, itself. Last but not least, a recur recurring motif of a woman in a black and red at the end of the last clip reminds us that uh, throughout the film we will see stage shots of women, models posing in the streets of Prague by historical buildings. Their common element will be a garment or a fashion accessory of the red color. This is an element by which Kitilova on the one hand represents the present again, and at the same time using female element she also disrupts the history written from male positions. And she also quotes herself. On the, uh, on the top side uh, of, this, of this slide, you can see shots uh, from Prague, the restless heart of Europe. Uh, and in the, in the bottom row, uh, on the contrary, you can see examples of the use of red color in Hitilova's fiction films. From la left to right, it's a uh, Cherk and the Queen, Fruits of Paradise, Emergency, a hoof here, a hoof there. Uh, and we can we, we we will be able to find uh, much more examples of uh, her using red as a uh, as a color for costume. These examples point to a long-term pattern in Hitilova's films, as only two middle ones were created before Prague, the restless heart of Europe, and the uh, very uh, left one and the very right one were, made, were created after this film. So it's a really a long-term pattern in her work using these kinds of uh, uh, colors and uh, color schemes in, in the composition. As a counterpoint, however, to the above-mentioned tendency to le uh, legitimizing the historical interpretation of history through the perspective of the Communist Party, appears one of the last sequences of the film, maybe the well-known sequences of the film, the most well-known sequences of the film, in which Hitilova appropriates documentary footage of the mass exercises of the communist era, so-called Spartakiads, and deforms their movement into a clip structure to the song Pražákům těm je tu hej by the, the band Pražský výběr Prague Selection. In this sequence, Chytilová takes her historical interpretation into prison, which she views in a form of a remix. She approximates the ornament of a socialist collective physical education, specifically its symbolic form, the Spartakiate, in Prague's Strahov Stadium, and through the manipulation of movement, acceleration, slowing down and editing, on the one hand deepens to the point of hypertrophy, the impression of the alienation of individuality within the collective ornament. On the other hand, combined with a modern song, dark post-rock poetics, with a distinctive stylization of musicians, she creates a stylish contrast of optimism and decadence, from which emerges an ironic commentary of Spartakiadism and by extension socialist collectivity. The chosen song, is simultaneously a song about Prague. Uh, the band was called Prague Selection and the song was called 
Pražákům, těm je tu hey, which means something like uh, to, to citizens of Prague, uh, every, uh, for citizens of Prague everything is okay, or something like that. In the lyrics, uh, the, the song playfully combines the names of Prague streets from the position of a confused, disoriented stranger who never wants to return to Prague. Hitilova's remixed mass ornament, from which I also created this gif, uh, reduces the collective or the society to an artistic formula moving in the frantic rhythm of a modern rock music. This image also underlines the ambivalence of meaning of her film. If we recall uh, the central philosophical message of the film, um, I quote again, the most important is an awareness of context, positive and negative relationships, an awareness of tradition, and a view that can encompass a broad horizon. She presents us the consciousness, the awareness of the context that lies, among other things, in the knowledge as a complex of harmonic and clashing concepts. Hitilova frames the Spartakiad sequence with the questions, why are, uh, with the question, why are we here? And at the end of the Spartakiad sequence, then the chorus of trainees shouts, we love life. So despite this, the ironic commentary of the socialist masses, Hitilova ends the film positively. By, re by returning to life, And in an opposition uh, to a foreigner who does not want to return to Prague, quoted by the lyrics of the accompanying song, she puts at the very end a quote by Vítězslav Nezval, which, on the contrary, points to the powerful beauty of Prague and which tempts to repeat life. In this quote, Kitilová's approach to history is also recalled by a pulsating temporal structure, a fleeting but returning, pervasive presence at every turn in the streets blazing with history. Thank you for your attention. Enjoy the film and when you, when you happen to be in Prague, remember Hitilova and the fact that everywhere you go, you step on history. Thank you. If uh, anybody has a question concerning the film uh, or the presentation, please feel free to wave or make noise. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, let me first say uh, um, that uh, I, I like the film very much, um, especially it makes one understand very clearly how much Hitilova loves Prague and culture, and opera, and so on, and of course not nature, landscape, and so on. What the film doesn't show is also very interesting. I mean, he doesn't show the dark side of the city, okay? He doesn't show any kind of ugliness, he doesn't show uh, poverty, uh, uh, or workers, there's only one little sequence. Um, he shows, of course, the, 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 the images of uh, World War II, Uh, I wonder um, <laughs> why, for example, she doesn't mention Kafka, which is one of, of course, one of the great writers. Um, I was wondering about that while watching the film, and uh, for me, it is Kafka is like uh, a very economical writer in a way. He's, if I were to use the Nietzschean terms, he's Apollinian, whereas she is Dionysian, right? I mean, she's. <laughs> Uh, she's the complete opposite. Um, so I wonder, uh, maybe there's also another reason why she doesn't mention it, and that's my real and only question I have is, was this film ever shown in Czechoslovakia? And if it did, uh, was there any kind of like uh, uh, censorship done or something? Was it shown in the complete version, like this one hour version? Uh, because of course this is not socialist realism, and um, That's it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as for 
Kafka. I'm not sure, but the thing is that she doesn't mention a lot of things in 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 a way. Like this is of course a selection. It's a, it is a it is a montage of a lot of things, but the omission of a lot of things at the same time as you you said. Um, what I wanted to like stress in my lecture is that the, her, her like dominant uh, she dominantly gazes on architecture it is the most of it of the film is about facades of, of the buildings and uh, this is what uh, she is interested in and in the development of the historical styles and you can um, like throughout the film you follow this line of uh, 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 very old buildings to the very new ones in the end this, uh, you you saw the new building of the national theater with those golden uh, golden uh, facade as well, and so on. So she she has this as uh, some uh, some uh, dominant uh, layer of uh, of uh, really very rapidly moving uh, collage of images uh, of the culture, uh, and uh, she doesn't mention literature a lot. Actually, uh, she mentions Macha, uh, who is really like a great. Uh, artist of the romantic era and uh, uh, very very well known and he's also but she mentions him through his uh, poem and then she mentions only Neswal and this is it she is not so much interested in uh, in poetry and in literature as, as so in uh, visual culture uh, I would say like visual architecture and then uh, theater which actually uh, the theater is very interesting how she uses it because she uh, she mostly uh, uses uh, contemporary theatrical performances to know to quote about something about the past actually so she uses uh, uh, the the um, Amadeus performance to quote about the the era of uh, of Mozart actually and about his uh, his uh, uh, personality and persona and she uses. Uh, other uh, other uh, contemporary like 19 early 1980s performances that somehow relate to the history uh, but uh, not so much f uh, f with the with the literature it's she's not so interested in written written worlds and but she uses music and she uses uh, she uses um, musical scores as well as mo uh, modern music so for Kafka, I would say, like, yeah, she's uh, she wasn't even when you think about the Czech New Wave, she wasn't the one who was uh, much inspired by Kafka. There were others like Juracek, for example, who is uh, who was an admirer of him, although he hated to be called Kafka's uh, <laughs> successor, but he, he his his works really resembled uh, what he what he did. But uh, but Hidilo you you mentioned it very right. She she wasn't interested in this. Uh, uh, kinds of uh, uh, simplistic minimalistic uh, um, approach to uh, to art she was much more uh, allegoric and uh, colorful and playful in in these kinds of words as uh, for the second part of the question about the censorship uh, uh, I don't have any like a really a written archival evidence about it but what I guess and what I wanted to uh, to say also in the lecture there must be some um, uh, some censorship for the film mostly because how she works with the era of the of uh, 1948 uh, she uh, it's really like a really the emblematic speech of Gottwald and uh, it's not Hitilova's uh, way of work like using the emblematic speech of the the most iconic Stalinist, uh, the, the most iconic president of the Stalinist era? No, uh, I wouldn't say so. So, uh, for like my interpretation is, and we would need to go deeper to the archives to find it. This was something that she had to do. Like it was order to use something like that. Uh, this uh, really symbolic speech, and uh, uh, but. Uh, uh, and this is also like a, one of the rare political statements even throughout the film there are some comments uh, on uh, the, the charles the fourth and his era some uh, some like uh, subtle political statements but this is really a very ex explicit one so uh, this is my guess is that this really was some 
uh, some ideological uh, ideological background of uh, of this. Uh, the film, uh, well, I I don't think that it, the film was screened in uh, in uh, Czechoslovakia in the 80s. I think it was only screened after the Velvet Revolution, and then it uh, became uh, quite uh, quite popular even for the use of uh, the Prague Selection Band, and which also was popular at, in the early 90s and so on. Uh, so. Uh, I wouldn't say it was screened in Czech cinemas or even in Czech TV, and not at all, like Czechoslovak, Czechoslovak TV in, in that time. It was meant to be uh, screened uh, abroad for Italians and maybe it was screened also in Germany when there is, uh, there is a German, German version, German, German version of the film. So yeah, but still uh, even the, the productions that were or there were to be screened uh, abroad were uh, were censored, of course, because the party wanted to have a control about the image of the country outside the outside Czechoslovakia, and the cultural policy was uh, was uh, overlooking uh, all everything that went went abroad as well. I was about to ask that, um, why is there a German version? Because this version was obviously not made in Germany, but in Czechoslovakia. Yeah, I, I would say it was for the distribution purposes, uh, but I'm not, uh, I don't know, actually. It's, I, I know that it is the only other language version in the archive, the Czech and the German one, there are. As I've got uh, the microphone, I might add uh, that um, I was very, very intrigued by the film um, because um, mainly, uh, principally, uh, it's an old-fashioned culture film. We call it in Germany. There's no English word for that, um, but uh, filmed uh, with modernist uh, cinematic strategies to undercut this uh, culture film approach. Um, but uh, when I saw it, I was wondering about the meaning of the models and uh, the passers-by and crowds in the street. Um, one could think um, that uh, there is uh, this glorious uh, past uh, of the city represented in the architecture and uh, well, uh, uh, and it doesn't affect uh, the life of the people who pass by, um, or does it? Or uh, um, uh, does she want to say uh, uh, that um, uh, they look uh, people? They look like people from nowadays, but they can't escape this historic past. What's your opinion about that? Uh, so that you can answer in one way. I even would go further than Winfried. I would say, it's, it's funny, I mean, the models are all the beautiful models. The males we see at the end are almost animals, <laughs> okay? Uh, but in any case, the masses are, in a way, stupid. In a way, they're disturbing the beauty of the buildings <laughs> and of the arts. So this is a high culture attitude, so to speak. Yeah, and obviously not a socialist attitude. Uh, isn't there a, a sort of arrogance in it? Um, as much as I like the film, I'm, I was intrigued too. Uh, but but it's you know, oh, culture survives, spirit survives. I mean that's almost German idealism in a way that you think, yeah, this is the center of the world, whereas it's of course not. Yeah. All this stuff has been built. There's only one scene where you see a worker, uh, actually two scenes where, where you see something is being constructed. So maybe it's a bit arrogant. Huh? Yeah, it is a bit arrogant, but I would say it's moralistic in a way, because of what, the, what the main argument of Hitilova is uh, uh, like to call these masses that do not care about what is around them to be aware of uh, what is uh, what they have around with the, this big history and so on. So, I've always read uh, like this the how the the 
what the what the comment what the voiceover o- always repeats was uh, this uh, be aware or um, focus on the knowledge of the past while she is filming the masses of people like f- flowing through the streets unaware about anything uh, so my my explanation would be that she is a moralist as always she 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 was she was always been um, she has always been a moralist and she wanted to educate people and uh, this is why she was also a very rude in in many uh, really like her uh, behavior so to other people because she wanted to uh, persuade them about their her her opinions and so on so but the the role of the models yeah it's <laughs> it's a tricky I, i i don't have a clear explanation of why she uses this uh, this kind of image but is a it's a constant uh, there it, it appears from the very not not the very beginning but but very early within the film there appears some uh, some kind of a model posing with the red red part of um, her her fashion uh, and uh, For me, it is a uh, really like uh, she quotes herself in some way because she uses the same kinds of image imagery in her films. So it is some some like a reference to her style. And at the same time, for me, it was really about posing a female element through to the history, which was uh, mostly m- represented but m- by, by male fighters, presidents, uh, or or. Uh, kings and uh, and so on and then she like juxtaposes it with uh, some female beauty what i don't uh, understand about it is that uh, really it is an ornament again like it's a uh, really like beauty of a, of a, of a woman uh, it is a it is a nothing it's a object objectif- objectification again like so it's a It's a bit tricky, like I <laughs> this kind of her use of uh, of the of these models. I have an, one question by myself. Um, it's a rather like obscure question. Um, I completely um, get uh, what you said in your uh, talk about this changing. Um, attitude towards film sequences that there are these like uh, film sequences that are not that much um, reflected upon through whatever kind of uh, filmic techniques uh, and aesthetics um, I thought that there's one thing that goes throughout the whole film and this is the use of snow as an kind of uh, element um, there are several scenes where people are sliding snowballing and at the beginning i think almost one third of the building shots you see melting snow and so on uh, through all the whole film do you comment on this <laughs> actually n- not <laughs> <laughs> i i did, like like for me like i have seen the film for many times but each but for each uh, screening i find myself intrigued by something else because it's there are so many like s- this kind of smaller motives uh, uh, like uh, At one point of uh, like mm, researching this film, I had a sense that there is a, a, that uh, she wanted to have a, uh, represented the whole cycle of the winter, spring, uh, uh, autumn, and uh, summer, uh, like the whole uh, whole cycle. Uh, but at the same time, I think it is again like disrupted. It is not cons- consistent of uh, like you you can't say that uh, the whole film that, uh, starts with a uh, with a winter and then goes to uh, spring and then to summer and the autumn. But uh, I I would guess she wanted to have all these seasons represented. Uh, what particular <laughs> was her interest in snow? I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, maybe there's another question on the camera work or editing um, because I also thought it was really extraordinary um, compared to other films by Ritilova and uh, it almost seemed like the camera work was influenced by on the one side animation or stop motion animation and on the other side avant-garde uh, cinema in a way um, I'd be interested um, because I didn't catch it um, who did the camera um, on this film and 
because I think that Jaroslav Kuchera was working with these techniques in the 60s, but... Yeah, I'm exactly. Sure. It's very tricky as well because it really resembles Kuchera's work, like very in, very much because there are its rapid movements, uh, like camera really, uh, uh, mm, like uh, crawling f about uh, through uh, through facades and through landscapes, and I don't know. And this is what Kuchera did. But the camera cameraman of this film was Jan Malir. Uh, who is not so well known, but he's a very, uh, mm, like, a very good camera camera operator of uh, of the s 70s and 80s, uh, and I would say that uh, she actually like did him to do the like make him made him to do these kinds of uh, shots. What I would say is also that. Uh, uh, there, if you can, there is also a lot of uh, work with the rhythm of the music and the camera movement. They n n had to do some uh, post production with this, although like doing these really, uh, really rapid, rapid m camera movements, then they even like uh, post produced it uh, to make it really in touch with the uh, inner resonance with the with the music, being it very very. Uh, Modern music or even the the old music, they it's it's in a in it's in a resonance. These kinds of uh, movements, yeah. Maybe another question about the dubbing be, m might be an odd question for you, as you <laughs> don't understand German that well, I, I guess. But um, is the style of the the voiceover almost the same, or is it like different in in? Yeah, in I measure? I have uh, I have the film really like connected with the voice of Miroslav Macháček, who really has a very distinct uh, deep tone of voice. So at the very beginning, I was really it was something very surprising for me to like uh, get uh, into this kind of uh, uh, voiceover. But in the end, I would say it. Uh, it worked, uh, but it's not the same. <laughs> it's not the same because uh, the fir first thing is that he also this voiceover had to um, uh, had to say something also for uh, uh, for the theater and so on, which is not in the Czech uh, voiceover. It's in the Czech voiceover, when there is uh, Mozart speaking, he speaks in Czech, so it uh, he speaks for himself. Similarly, when there were those. Uh, 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 speeches by Žižka, which was used from Otakar Vavra's uh, feature film. Again, like it was used as it uh, was in the film. No voiceover did. The voiceover was silent at that moment. So uh, the the whole soundtrack was a little bit l like different because the German voiceover had to speak for them. Otherwise, you won't wouldn't understand what uh, that this is also important. Uh, the only f uh, there was uh, only one uh, moment when uh, I would expect the voiceover to say something and he it didn't maybe it wasn't uh, I don't know why uh, but it was the last uh, scream of the crowd of males uh, at, the, at, the, at the at the at the end of uh, the uh, Spartakiad sequence when they really like uh, they shout we love life. Uh, which is really like like the chorus shout shouting of we life we love life and it's the end of the Spartakiad sequence. So, but it was interesting that the the voiceover didn't uh, shout anything <laughs> at that moment. All right. Um, if there are more questions, one over there. Sorry, one more question, uh, and that's the question about educating people. People. Um, I mean, she might have said that, but clearly avant-garde is, is not uh, the kind of thing how you educate people and not workers. So uh, that's just, I think, an excuse, so to speak. Uh, it's not, I mean, it's not really honest. I mean, and sometimes that's what I would criticize maybe about the film. It tries to do too much. It doesn't give the spectator time to, uh, you know, reflect maybe yeah. on something. And uh, so, in a way, the dumb masses that are running around, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, I mean, you have to understand, they have little time and don't have the kind of education you have as a filmmaker. So, 
Right, right. Yeah, the film is really overloaded with the uh, meanings and with the with the references. So it's not a lot comprehensible to uh, ordinary people, I would say. Like even, uh, yeah, even I had uh, like before, for example, before doing a research on uh, Latina Magica, that multimedia theater, I wouldn't know the reference is the Black Monk because it's not known to people who were not. Uh, uh, eyewitnesses or people who lived at the time it's not a well known a uh, well known uh, performance so or maybe some uh, theater experts so it's a really expert knowledge that she uh, that she performs in the in the film but at the same time like she uh, she does these uh, moralistic uh, claims throughout the whole film so it's, uh, the film should be about uh, learning from history basically yeah, but I I agree that it is uh, it is a uh, elite at attitude in some way. All right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> I think it calls polysemic text. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, thank you, um, Florian Hoof, and uh, thank you, Lucy Chesalkova, for being here tonight. And the, I only have like the um, hint to the next lecture. It will be in two weeks. And um, Jindrischka Blauwal will talk about uh, the very late afternoon of a fawn. And I think, or I hope, I might see some of you in two weeks. And now I can only wish you a good night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>